Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Binyamin Chong Alfaris with the top reports from the world economy. Coming up, high tensions, tensions at the EU as some participants are forced to increase their contribution. And Israel seeks to limit cash transactions. First, the headlines. Brazil's leftist president Dilma Rousseff narrowly won re-election on Sunday in one of the closest, most divisive campaigns in Brazil in decades. Rousseff won 51.6 percent of votes after convincing voters that her party's strong record of reducing poverty was more important than the recent economic slump. In her victory speech, she reiterated her commitment to fiscal discipline and controlling inflation. Josefi's triumph rides on the support of roughly 40% of Brazilians who live in households earning less than $700 a month. Her Workers' Party has since 2003 lifted 40 million from poverty, cut unemployment to record lows, and greatly reduced hunger. The re-election vote is a vote of hope especially for improving the actions of those who have been governing. I know that is what the people say when they re-elect a leader. That is why I want to be a much better president than I have been up till now. The European Central Bank said 25 of the EU's 130 top lenders failed landmark health checks at the end of 2013, but most have since repaired their finances. Regulators identified 13 banks that still need to come up with a total of $12 billion in extra capital. The test required banks to show they had enough capital to survive a crisis in which Europe's economy fell 7 percent and unemployment rose to 13 percent. The audit is aimed at preventing another financial crisis and also serves to boost public confidence in the banking sector. Since July last year, SSM banks have undertaken various measures to strengthen their balance sheets by more than 200 billion euros, including six, uh, 60 billion of capital increases. Negotiations over the 12th nation Trans-Pacific Partnership made significant progress over the weekend, though Japan and the United States remain at odds. The United States insists that Japan lower barriers to agricultural imports, but Japan wants to protect sensitive products including pork, beef, dairy and sugar. An agreement between Tokyo and Washington is crucial to securing the broader pact, as other partners are reluctant to commit until the two resolve their differences. President Barack Obama has expressed hopes of concluding a deal on the ambitious trade pact among Pacific countries by the end of the year. We have made substantial progress, but there certainly are issues that remain. We've not yet reached a final agreement on a market access uh, package, and therefore there is uh, more work to be done before we can say that we're satisfied uh, with, with market access. Ukrainian Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk said discussions on forming a new coalition in the parliament would start immediately as pro-Western parties win the election. Following the elections, pro-European parties are set to hold an overwhelming majority in the chamber for the first time in Ukraine's 23 years of independence. But the election results do little for the Ukrainian economy, which is set to slide as much as 10 percent this year. And while the International Monetary Fund expects Ukraine to default on its debt within weeks, officials say they will likely require an additional $17 billion to keep afloat. The basis of the new coalition is the association agreement with the European Union. And this is what has to be the basis for that agreement. Swedish defense group Saab on Monday sealed a $5.44 billion jet deal with Brazil's Ministry of Defense. Saab will develop and produce 36 Gripen NGA and G fighter aircraft for the Brazilian Air Force. Saab also entered a contract for cooperation with Brazil, whereby it will transfer technology to Brazilian industry for about 10 years. Brazil's decision to select the Swedish company dealt a blow to its two more important allies, the U.S. and France, both of which had competing aircraft in the race. Thousands of Hungarians protested in Budapest on Sunday against a planned new tax on Internet data transfers. The draft tax bill contains a provision for Internet providers to pay a tax of 60 U.S. cents per gigabyte of data traffic. Protesters said the measure would impede equal access to the Internet, deepening the digital divide between Hungary's lower economic groups. 
the government in recent years also imposed special taxes on the banking, retail, energy and telecom sectors to keep the budget deficit in check. This is a good occasion for a lot of people to come here to show that they are discontent with the government's tax and economic policies. This was only the icing on the cake, but it's interesting that this topic got people together this much. Many other protests did not. As European economies continue to weigh on a global economic recovery, some of the trade bloc's participants are expected to increase their contribution. But UK Prime Minister David Cameron, who aims to renegotiate the terms of Britain's membership and offer Britons a referendum on staying in the Union, is fed up. Daniel Roth has the details. A shift in the European Union's budget has led to a major row between British Prime Minister David Cameron and other EU officials over a demand that the UK contribute $2.75 billion, or around 2 billion euros. Britain's total contribution to the EU this year has been just under $14 billion. Prime Minister Cameron responded by lashing out at the European body, giving weight to a growing conversation about Britain's secession from the European organization. We've invested in this organization. We're a leading player in it. And you do not you know, join an association that suddenly thumps you with a bill for €2 billion Euros three weeks before you've got to pay it. It is not an acceptable way to behave. And, and you know, this organization has got to understand that if it behaves in this way, uh, you know, it shouldn't get surprised when its members say, this cannot go on, you know, and it's got to change. European Commission President Jose Manuel Borroso suggested that this should not have been such a shock as the system for gathering funds for the European Union was agreed upon by all members and based on information given by each member nation, according to a BBC report. European finance ministers agreed to sit at an emergency meeting to deal with the issue. These emergency meetings need to take place. The figures need to be thoroughly investigated. An explanation of how this happened needs to be properly produced. England is not the only member country being asked to pay more. The list of countries compelled to pay includes the Netherlands, Cyprus, Italy and Greece, according to a leaked EU document. Meanwhile, it lists France, Poland, Austria, Denmark and Germany as set to see a reduction in their bills. German Chancellor Angela Merkel expressed sympathy for the British reaction. It is not easy to pick up 2.1 billion euros once the budget is voted or when in full preparations for the next budget. That is why we find that finance ministries should think about this again. As of now, the sum is expected by December 1st. Still, nothing seems to be set in stone as the EU works through another bump in the road. The Israeli cabinet has unanimously approved a new recommendation to limit the use of cash in Israel, as about one-fifth of Israel is off the books. The plan is intended to limit the shadow economy as cash and checks ease tax evasion, money laundering, terror funding, and other criminal offenses. Here's the report. Up to 20 percent of Israel's economy exists off the books in a so-called shadow economy of hard-to-trace cash and checks, according to a report from the prime minister's office. It is estimated that the state is losing between 10 and 13 million dollars in tax revenue as tax evasion is made easier when using cash to hide from authorities. The Israeli government is aiming to reduce the amount of black market traffic within its purview by pushing electronic transactions rather than cash or checks. Included in the list of measures are moves to reduce fees on debit card use, setting a maximum amount for cash and check transactions, the latter which will be capped at one million shekels, and banning blank checks from use. The Israeli cabinet has already approved the set of measures to limit the use of cash in Israel, but the unanimous decision will be brought in front of the Knesset for a vote before it is in place as law. Joining us now is Baker Tilly, Israel tax expert, CPA and advocate Guy Reshtik. Mr. Reshtik, thanks for joining us. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So just to so understand, I mean, what exactly are the recommendations by a locker committee? Well, the recommendations are supposed to limit the use of cash in uh, individuals' transactions with um, commercial um, uh, business. Yeah. So, for example, if uh, in the past you could uh, hire someone or pay someone in cash, mm -hmm. now you, couldn't, you cannot pay in cash unless it's less than 10,000 shekels, and in the next year it will be limited to 5,000 shekels. So, for example, if you order some, uh, I don't know, some renovation to your uh, yeah. house, yeah. you should pay only in checks or credit cards if the limit of the uh, transaction is more than 10,000 shekels. What is your opinion on all of this? Well, my opinion is, uh, you know, I think that, first of all, any uh, 
any fight with the black market is blessed because there is a lot of black money here in Israel. Yeah. But I think they, they could have done it better because uh, there are better ways to uh, fight with those uh, transactions. For example, um, we, we have in mind, uh, you know, there, there is a public uh, speaking about the uh, duty of reporting, general duty reporting like in the US, mm -hmm. which is not happening in Israel. I think that the, uh, these limitations are uh, small money because they will not uh, limit the uh, exchange of uh, uh, black money. So in, where, is the, where is the big money? Well, the big money is supposed to be in other, uh, you know, in, in the tax planning. Yeah. And the big money is in some, um, uh, some uh, population here in Israel. Mm -hmm. L let me give you an example, okay? okay. Let's say that you have, uh, like we said before, uh, someone who uh, renovates your house. Yes. And uh, in the past, you could have paid him in cash. Mm -hmm. And let's say this renovator is um, reporting on its whole income. Right. Okay, in the past, Let's take a transaction of, I know, 12,000 new Israeli shekels. Okay. In the past, you could have paid him in cash. And now, let's say that he's coming to uh, someone's house uh, which have only cash, and he wants to pay him in cash. He cannot pay him 12,000 new Israeli shekels because of these new, new uh, limitations. Right. So what I, what I suspect that will happen is that he will pay him, let's say, 9,000 shekels uh, against an invoice, right. and 3,000 or 2,000 new Israeli shekels under the table. But isn't that happening anyways? I mean, don't we have a situation anyways at this point where um, some workers, you know, come sort of through the back door and say, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you this for a cheaper amount so I don't have to pay taxes. You don't have to pay taxes. We have a better deal between us. Isn't that the well, reason why all this shadow economy has come about? Well, I think it's a good point, but you have uh, different ways to fight against it. For example, let's take the, let's take the United States. The U.S. have a different tax regime than in Israel. Mm -hmm. It gives more expenses that you can deduct on your uh, 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 income tax return mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. in Israel. For example, private uh, expenses. Right. If in Israel you change the tax law by giving some expenses to the Israeli taxpayers that can be deducted in their uh, tax return, then you have an incentive for them not to pay under the table. Right. So, of course. Of course. Well, Mr. Guy Reshtek, advocate and CPA from Baker Tilly Israel, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. And we move on now for a discussion of other reports from around the world in Media Watch. Daniel Ra, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Good. So, New York has very many different faces. I understand you have a story for us about the two different faces of New York. Yeah, so uh, The Guardian ha ha has this piece. It's really, really personal. It's a uh, tale of two cities, a tale of two New Yorks, really. Uh, it's two pieces in one by brothers, Tim and John Freeman, one of which moved to New York, uh, got a job, got inheritance uh, from, from a relative, bought an apartment, and lived a very, very good life in New York. Mm. The other moved a little later, and because of mental illness, didn't have access to, to this inheritance, and struggled, mm. and ended up, they ended up living blocks away from each other, one in a very nice apartment, and the other in a shelter, sort of going through all of the realities of what that means. And this piece really, uh, uh, put the numbers, it includes some numbers, some staggering numbers, 55,000 homeless people any given night in New York. Uh, median income of the top 1% going from four, 450,000 to over 700,000 between 1990 and 2010. These numbers are there, but this story is really about these two brothers who kind of uh, embark on life in New York City right. and end up on two completely different sides of the coin. Uh, within blocks of one another. It's a, it's a really Im impressive thing to read uh, and really it basically makes puts a face to the numbers of the reality of New York City, isn't it? Right, and you know, and they really, they dig in deep to this idea that, that there are a lot of stories to tell and the ones that matter most are the ones that, that have faces. What is the conclusion that we're supposed to draw from this story though? I think the conclusion is a conclusion we've drawn many times on this show is that we can see divergent paths for people even within a few blocks from each other. The 
the class differences are really staggering and growing, uh, not just in New York City, obviously, but around the world. And this is kind of, uh, you know, so we're kind of faced with this reality, this reality that these two brothers came from right. the same home. Right. Uh, minor genetic differences led to major life chain life differences which of course is basically uh uh, a critique, so to speak, on social services in New York City? Yeah, that too, you know, the, the life in the shelters that's described in, in the piece about that, it's really hard to read, it's really hard to read, especially when it's next to the other story. Okay, well, Daniela, thanks for sharing that story with us. That is the end of The Economy Magazine, your daily source for economic and financial reports at I-24 News. I'm Benjamin Chalafaris. Follow me on Twitter, Chalafaris, and send us your comments via the feedback link on our website. Thank you.